You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is. Jacob Ball. Hello. Sports fans. Welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk, and I have to start with a death that broke as I was editing Friday's show, and that is the absolutely tragic death of the golden boy, Paul Horning, who died on Friday at the age of 84. Paul Horning could do everything on the football field. He could run. He could defend. He could kick. He could throw. We've heard the saying, jack of all trades, master of none. Horning was a jack of all trades, master of all. You won't know it from looking at the stats. But from the late 50s to the mid-60s, there were very few players that were as dominant as Paul Horning. He went to college at Notre Dame. And I'll fast forward through his college career. All you need to know is that in 1955, the Fighting Irish went 8-2. and two. Good season. Very good season, as a matter of fact. Horning was an All-American that year. The year after, Notre Dame regressed tremendously. They went 2-8. and eight. Despite that, Horning won the Heisman Trophy that year. Why did he win the Heisman? Probably because he was so blasted versatile. He led Dame in passing, rushing, scoring, kick returns, punt returns, punting, PBUs. He was second in interceptions, second in tackles. Like I said... Jack of all trades, master of all. Paul Horning is the only player in history to win the Heisman Trophy for a losing team. And I can pretty much guarantee that he's going to be the only person to win the Heisman Trophy for a losing team. There's no way that would happen today. The Packers took him first overall in the 1957 draft. Now, it took Horning a while to get going in the NFL. 57 and 58, he underwhelmed. 57 was a bad year by all accounts. 58, he actually did contribute as a kicker. He made over half his field goals... Only missed one extra point. That was a bad Packers team anyway. But give Horning credit. He found a way to contribute for a Scooter McLean team. In 1959, Vince Lombardi took over as Packers head coach. And that is when Horning really hit his stride. Horning made his first Pro Bowl. He made second-team All-Pro. 
He had a career high in rushing yards with 681. And he had seven touchdowns. His field goal kicking took a step back, but an extra point, again, he only missed one. His 94 total points led the NFL. The year after that, Horning had his best season. He had 671 rushing yards, 13 rushing touchdowns, 15 total touchdowns. Both of those touchdown marks led the NFL, and Horning made his last Pro Bowl, but for the first time ever, he was named first team All-Pro. Again, he led the NFL in scoring. The year after that, Horning proved his versatility. He ran the ball really well, was good as a receiver, continued contributing as a kicker, contributed a little bit as a passer, Contributed a little on defense. For the third straight year, he led the NFL in scoring. Because of all that, he won MVP. Made his last first team All-Pro. And he won his first ever NFL championship. The year after that, Horning took a little bit of a step back, but he still won an NFL championship. One of the biggest what-ifs of Horning's career is how great his stats could have been if he wasn't splitting carries with Jim Taylor. All due respect to Taylor. And look, it worked. Alright, the Packers were incredibly dominant. Jim Taylor's a Hall of Famer. One of the best running backs of the 60s. The Packers had two of the best running backs of the 60s. I understand there were only so many touches. But without Taylor, it's fair to wonder how great Horning's stats could have been. Just like without Horning it's fair to wonder how great Taylor's stats could have been. In 1963, Horning's career changed forever. He, along with Alex Karras, were suspended from football indefinitely for betting on NFL games and associating with, quote-unquote, undesirable persons. To Horning's credit, he owned it right away. He was very apologetic. He said, look, I always gave 100%. I didn't throw anything, but I did this. I own it. I'm sorry. Karras had a different approach, but... Regardless, both of them had to take a year off from football. Vince Lombardi did a lot to convince Pete Rozelle to reinstate Horning and Karras. Another thing that Lombardi did for Horning was get him weekend passes out of the army to play on Sundays. Lombardi was a friend of President Kennedy. Horning was serving in the army in 1961. Lombardi called President Kennedy and said, hey, I need my star player. Kennedy arranged for Horning to be able to play in the 61 NFL championship game. 
It's a good thing he did, because in that game, Horning set the scoring record in an NFL title game with 19. James White would go on to break that record in Super Bowl 51. Another record that Horning had was the all-time record for points in a season with 176. Like I said, he set that in 1960. That record stood for 46 years until LaDainian Tomlinson went on to break it. Tomlinson finished that year with 186 points. But Horning got his 176 points in 12 games. Tomlinson needed 16 to get 186. So would Paul Horning have scored 11 points if he had four extra games? The answer is yes. Horning was around for some other titles. In 1965, the Packers won the NFL title. But by then, Horning was really a shell of his former self. He was still contributing, but he wasn't the dominant player of old. The year after that was the first Super Bowl. Horning didn't play. He had a pinched nerve. He sat out. Horning was traded to the Saints after that, but didn't play for him because his neck injury forced him to retire early. I met Paul Horning once. I was at a show in Chicago. I had just gotten a 66 Packers autographed picture. Before I got the picture mounted and framed, I found out about a show in Chicago that some of the old Packers were doing. Horning, Herb Adderley, Donnie Anderson, I think, was there. I don't remember who else. But my mom and I went to Chicago to fill out the picture. Horning was a really nice guy. It's kind of funny. Everyone else signed in blue. Horning signed in black. The person that he was with apologized to me. And I said to her, Don't worry, he's Paul Horning. He can do whatever he wants. Wouldn't be the first time he did something like that. (laughs) Yeah, I was making a reference to his gambling suspension. But look, Horning was really nice. I like that his signature stands out. Like I said, one of the most versatile players in NFL history. He died from dementia. I didn't get that when I met him. It seemed like he was still there, but look, that was a while ago, so you can rapidly deteriorate, unfortunately. May he rest in peace. Alright, now on to the modern day NFL. And I'll start with Eagles Giants. Last week... I said that the Giants needed to win this game and the Bengals game that's happening not this coming Sunday, the Sunday after, for me to think they're a halfway decent team. I mean, make no mistake about it, this game was incredibly important for both teams. If the Eagles win... They're 4-5-1. and one. No other team in the NFC East has more than two wins. They're sitting pretty. 
if the Giants win, they're within striking distance of the Eagles for first place in the NFC least. As much as it kills me to say it, because no one hates the Giants more than me, they looked really, really good yesterday. Daniel Jones made some really good decisions, didn't turn the ball over, the second straight game that he hasn't. He threw some dimes to Darius Slayton, some dimes to Sterling Shepard, some dimes to Golden Tate. I mean, I hate the Danny Dimes nickname, but it proved apt yesterday. And he had the big 34-yard touchdown run. The turf monster didn't eat him up. Wayne Gallman had a couple short touchdown runs. One where he leapt over the pile. Alfred Morris looked really good. I'll tell you, there are some Giants fans that are saying, don't pay Saquon Barkley. Roll with Gallman and Morris. They don't want to pay Barkley because he's injury prone and he's a running back. I disagree with that immensely, but you know what? There's something to be said about the Giants hanging in the playoff race without their best player. Maybe Barkley will have to take a little bit of a discount. I'd still try to keep him around, but I wouldn't instantly give him a crazy contract. The key to this game, though, was the Giants' defense. The Eagles were 0 for 9 on third downs. They couldn't extend a drive to save their lives. Wentz was okay, not great, not terrible. I mean, you've got to wonder when Doug Peterson pulls him for Jalen Hurts. There are a lot of calls for that, and I understand why. Miles Sanders and Boston Scott looked fantastic. Scott always kills the Giants. And Sanders has had a really good season. But at the end of the day, you've got to be able to convert on third downs. You can't go 0 for 9. This Giants defense is really coalescing at the right time. There were no weak spots. I mean, I'll say this, the defensive line didn't play that great. But they're usually really good. I'll give them a pass. The linebackers stepped up. Blake Martinez has had a really good season. He looked good yesterday. Jabril Peppers looked really good. Logan Ryan looked really good. James Bradbury looked great. Isaac Yadam looked really good. This is scaring me. No one's been more critical of the Giants than me, but look. There is a real chance that they can win the NFC East. You take a look at the rest of that division... The Eagles have a tough schedule the rest of the way. Brown, Seahawks, Packers, Saints, Cardinals, Cowboys, Washington. Okay, the final two games are easy. But there's a real chance that they're going to lose their next five games. The Cowboys with Garrett Gilbert starting? There's no way they're making the playoffs. I understand they have an easy schedule coming up. But I don't trust them as far as I can throw them. Washington, maybe? But those two losses to the Giants are really going to hurt them. I mean, I'll tell you, they've got the Bengals on Sunday... 
and the Cowboys on Thanksgiving, they have to win those two games if they're going to win the NFC East. You take a look at the Giants, though. They've got the Bengals in 13 days. Coming off the bye, they can win that. And they finish up the season against the Cowboys. Those are their two definite winnable games. They've got some other games in December that they can win. They've got the Browns and Ravens back-to-back. God only knows what the Browns, they are an infuriating team. I don't think the Giants are going to win that game, but it's not impossible. And the Ravens are struggling right now. The way this Giants defense is playing, they're going to stifle Lamar Jackson. I mean, they still need to beat the Bengals for me to really believe that they're a threat to win that division. But if they win that game, they're 4-7. and seven. We can laugh about it all we want, but the simple fact is a 5- or 6-win team is probably going to win the NFC East. It's very possible that's the Giants. They seem to be buying into what Joe Judge is preaching. Golden Tate was very apologetic. And he got right back in the swing of things with a big catch. Jason Garrett, I thought, called a great game. Patrick Graham, I thought, called a great game. I thought he dropped people back at the right time. I thought he sent pressure at the right time. This is scary for me as a Giants hater. There's no question. I didn't think they were going to win this game. I picked the Eagles in my offline pool. But now the ball is in their court. The Giants have control of their own destiny. They seem to be peaking at the right time. If it was up to them, they may not have the bye this week. You don't want to lose that momentum. I understand you don't have any control over that. But still, you've got to think that those Giants players want to play the Bengals today. Get in great position in the race to win the NFC least. Again, as a Giants hater, watching that game yesterday... Watching the Eagles score on the opening drive to open up the second half. Thinking, you know what, this is a start of the choke. The Giants never win a meaningful game. I have nothing to worry about. And then seeing the Giants follow that up three minutes later with a Wayne Gorman touchdown... That's when I knew it was over. I didn't care that the Eagles scored the drive after that. They had the opportunity to seize the game right there and they couldn't. I just didn't have a good feeling after Gallman scored his second touchdown of the game. And then the Giants put their foot on the throat of the Eagles in the fourth quarter. It was funny, my father said to me, Boy, the Giants look good. I had to look at him and I said, Yeah, they did. They played really well. This was not a good week for me. How can I be so despondent as a football fan in a week where the Jets don't play? Oh, I know how. The Giants win a game that they have to win. The Packers come back against the Jaguars. The Jaguars had every opportunity to win that game. But they couldn't seal the deal. And the Patriots take advantage of a bad Baltimore Ravens offense. They've got to move on from Greg Roman quickly. Alright, that offense has become stale. It's not working anymore. Promote James Urban now. I mean, now I'm hearing people say, Hey, the Patriots are coming back. They're 4-5. and five. It's still possible. 
They've got to leapfrog a ton of teams. They're still two games back of that final wild card spot. They've got to catch the Raiders, Dolphins, Ravens, Browns, and Titans. I don't think it's happening. It was scary to watch that game yesterday. Give the Patriots credit for taking advantage of a dreadful Jets team and a struggling Ravens team that couldn't do anything yesterday in the rain. But if I use my noodle, I'm not overly concerned about the Patriots. It was tough to watch it yesterday, but I'm really not too concerned about them. I'm concerned about the Giants. I'll say that. There is one more game that I want to talk about. The game that had one of the craziest endings you'll ever see. That, of course, is Bill's Cardinals. I'll set the stage for you. The Bills are down by three for most of the fourth quarter. They can't get anything going against the Cardinals. It seems like the Cardinals are going to win this game, but Josh Allen, late, engineers a really good 78-yard drive to give the Bills the lead late. 34 seconds left on the clock. Kyler Murray is at his own 25-yard line. He completes three passes right away. 11 seconds left on the clock. First and 10 at the Bills 43. Murray rolls out to his left. Bear in mind, he's a righty. So he has to contort his body in such a way that he's able to throw the ball 50 yards downfield. That's where Murray was when he let this ball go. The 50-yard line. He's looking for DeAndre Hopkins. Great decision. What's not boding well for Hopkins is that he has three of the best defensive backs in the NFL on him. Tredavious White, Jordan Poyer, and Micah Hyde. In the split second that you saw the ball headed towards Hopkins with those three Bills defenders around him, there's no way you thought Hopkins was going to catch that. Somehow, Hopkins catches it. It's one of the greatest catches you'll ever see. Period. It's right up there with the Aaron Rodgers to Jeff Janis Hail Mary from about seven years ago. Maybe a little less. Hopkins is being triple teamed. Forget the fact that it's against three of the best defenders in the NFL. He's triple teamed. There's no way he's catching that. In Madden, there's no way he's catching that. There's no way that Murray can get an accurate throw off, right? No. It was a Herculean effort by both of them. Kyler Murray to get this ball in the end zone, to put it in a place that Hopkins had a chance at it, but the catch was better. You've got Hopkins going up and Morsing White, Morsing Hyde, and Morsing Poyer. Rachel Bush, if you want to leave Jordan Poyer right now, I have no problem with that. <laughs> Me and every other heterosexual male. (laughs) But look, that's one of the craziest endings you'll ever see. If you haven't seen it yet, I don't know how. But if you haven't, you've got to find it. I retweeted it. My reaction in watching it was the same as DJ Humphreys. 
He couldn't believe it. The Cardinals fans that were watching couldn't believe it. I don't think Cliff Kingsbury could believe it. Iron Eagle was right. It was a miraculous catch. There were a couple extensions that broke as yesterday's games were unfolding. The first concerns David Bakhtiari getting an incredibly mammoth contract. He got a four-year extension worth a hundred five and a half million dollars in new money. The base value of the extension is 23 mil a year. Both of those shatter the existing records. Ronnie Stanley, eat your heart out. Laramie Tunsil, eat your heart out. But you know what? This is a great move for the Packers. Bakhtiari has never had a pro football focus grade worse than 69. And that's a nice grade. Bear in mind, that was in his rookie year. This year, it's 88.5. That's incredible. He's a big part of that fantastic Packers offensive line with himself, Corey Lindsley, Rick Wagner, Elton Jenkins, and Billy Turner. If you're going to win one more time with Aaron Rodgers, you've got to keep him upright. Keeping Bakhtiari in the fold is a great way of keeping him upright. There is no way that you can hate this move. Did the Packers shatter the existing mark for offensive linemen? The answer is yes. But did they have to? The answer is yes. Moving on now to the Giants extending their kicker, Graham Gano, for three years at 14 mil in new money. Nine million dollars of that is guaranteed. And that's fair for Gano. That puts him in the upper tier of highest paid kickers. He's not as high as Tucker. He's not as high as Butker. Not as high as Gold. Which is fair because he's not as good as those guys. But, Gano has always been incredibly reliable. The Giants tried Aldrich Rosas last year. It failed. Dave Gettleman brought in a guy who he knows from his days with the Panthers in Gano. And he has been as close to perfect as you can be. Gano has hit more field goals than any other kicker in the NFL with 21. He's only missed one field goal. He hasn't missed an extra point. And the field goal that he missed was a 57-yarder. It's okay that he missed that. That's not the kind of kick where... It's like, oh my god, this guy's dreadful, we have to cut him. No, it's 57 yards. Great job by the Giants in locking him up. I know a lot of Giants fans really like Gano, and I understand why. He is a really, really good kicker. He's done a great job for the Giants. This is a really good move. All right, now I'll give you some NBA Volk talk. And before I get to the James Harden trade that may or may not happen, I'll talk about the trades that we know are going to happen. 
And I'll start with the defending champions getting better by trading Danny Green and the 28th overall pick to the Thunder for Dennis Schroeder. My choice for 6th man of the year last year is now going to the reigning and defending NBA champions. Even though Green is a local guy, he was born in North Babylon, he went to high school in Manhasset, that's not too far from my house. I've never been crazy about Green. Just watching him play, I never thought he was that good. He's a good shooter, but that's all he is. He's very one-dimensional. He's won three NBA titles, good for him. He's had a career that anyone would be happy about. He made the all-defensive team a few years ago. But I've just never loved watching him play. I don't know why, just something about him. On the other hand, you have Dennis Schroeder. Like I said, my pick for sixth man of the year last year. A guy who averaged 19 points per game last year. To go with three and a half rebounds and four assists per game. The guy's had a really underrated career. You'd think that this was his first really good year. It actually isn't. In his career, he's averaged 14 points per game. To go with just under three rebounds per game and a little over four and a half assists per game. He's had a really good career. And I don't even think it's a guarantee that Schroeder comes off the bench for the Lakers. Think about this lineup for a minute. Schroeder, KCP, assuming they bring him back. LeBron James, Anthony Davis, assuming he comes back, which I think he will. And insert center here. If Davis is okay with playing center, then Kyle Kuzma can enter the starting lineup. I know Davis doesn't like playing center, but whatever. Look, as far as big threes go, LeBron, AD, and Schroeder, it falls off once you get to Schroeder. Schroeder's not at that level. But he's a really, really good player. He's a true point guard. LeBron did a great job in that role. For the first time in his career, he averaged a double-double, being the Lakers' primary ball handler. But this gives Frank Vogel some options now. And they don't have to bring back Rajon Rondo, who's not getting any younger. This is a great trade for the Lakers. Speaking of former Thunder guards, Chris Paul is now a Phoenix Sun. There's a lot to unpack here, but what it is is Paul and Abdel Nader went to the Suns in exchange for Ricky Rubio, Kelly Oubre, Ty Jerome, Jalen LeCue, or LaCroix, I'm not sure exactly how he pronounces it, and a top 12 protected 2022 first rounder. If it doesn't go to the Thunder in 2022, it becomes top 10 protected in 2023, then top 8 protected in 2024, and then unprotected in 2025. This is a fantastic trade for the Suns. For the longest time, they've needed a point guard. They tried Ricky Rubio. It wasn't that great. Rubio wasn't that great with the Suns. They tried Ty Jerome. He had a terrible rookie season. Jalen LeCue, or LaCroix, however he pronounces it, Barely got into games. 
Now you take a look at that starting lineup. Chris Paul, Devin Booker, Mikhail Bridges. Insert power forward here. Precious Achua would make perfect sense for him. And DeAndre Ayton. Look, I understand you need some veterans to flesh out that bench. But that's the makings of a really good starting lineup. You know what you're going to get in Paul. You know what you're going to get in Devin Booker. There's no way the Suns are trading Booker now. That backcourt of Paul and Booker is going to be fantastic. And DeAndre Ayton's one of the best centers in the game. I like Mikhail Bridges. He showed signs of breaking out last year. And I think he'll continue on that upward trajectory. And if Precious Achua goes to the Suns, who I think they're going to be in position to take a 10, you can't ask for anything better as a Suns fan. I understand you've got to flesh out the bench. But I think there will be some players that want to go to the Suns now. This is a young, up-and-coming Suns team now, and they just got exponentially better by addressing their biggest position of need, which was point guard. A lot of people love playing with Chris Paul. I think people are going to want to play with Devin Booker. I think they're going to want to play with DeAndre Ayton. It wouldn't surprise me at all if the Suns snuck into the playoffs next year. Depending on what they do with their bench. As for the Thunder, they did a good job in building for the future with this trade. Rubio will be solid for him, but he doesn't have a long-term spot on the Thunder. I like Kelly Oubre a lot. Last year, he averaged just under 19 points per game. He's not the best three-point shooter in the world, but it can improve. He has the ability to improve it. I think Oubre can be a part of the Thunder's rebuild going forward. I like the idea of him and Shea playing together. Ty Jerome still has some potential. I'm not going to give up on him after just one year. And Jalen LeCue or LaCroix is basically just a throw-in. I'm not expecting too much from him. The first rounder will help. The Thunder are set up fantastically well for the future. And they've hit on their draft picks. They've hit on the young guns that they've identified in trades. It's going to be up to Sam Presti to do it again. If anyone can, it's him. But I feel sorry for him that he has to constantly do this in Oklahoma City. No one wants to play for Oklahoma City. It's really sad because the fans are great. It's just the fact that it's such a small market. No one wants to play there. And the final piece of this trade, Abdul Nader. He's a good three-point shooter. He shot 37.5% from beyond the arc last year. He averaged 6.3 points per game last year. He's a solid player. I'll say this. The Suns bench doesn't need a ton of work. It needs some work, but not a ton. They still have Elio Kobo, who I like. I think he can be a really good backup point guard. They're going to need a backup shooting guard, no question. Abdel Nader at small forward. Cameron Johnson at power forward. Frank Kaminsky at center. That's not bad. It's not great. There's room for improvement, but that's not bad. Like I said, it wouldn't stun me if the Suns got into the playoffs next year as an eight seed. 
Not at all. Moving on now to the minor Nets trade that happened. And this is official. The Nets traded Zahn and Musa and the Raptors second rounder along with Cash to the Pistons for Bruce Brown. Musa was never able to carve out a consistent role with the Nets. I did like him entering the 2018 draft. I thought it was possible he could carve out a nice niche for himself in the NBA, but he hasn't been able to do that. He's played well in the G League. Give him a fresh start somewhere else. I don't mind that. I wish Musa nothing but the best, but he was never going to get a shot with the Nets. The second rounder, who cares? Cash, who cares? Bruce Brown is actually a sneaky good acquisition by Sean Marks. The Nets don't have a great perimeter defender. Kyrie Irving is not a great defender. Bruce Brown is. This guy once had a game where he held James Harden to 0 for 10 from the field. He's very Lugans Dort like. He really is. Last year, Brown averaged just under 9 points a game. Just under 5 rebounds per game and 4 assists per game. He also averaged over a steal a game and half a block per game. Bear in mind, this guy is 6'4 and he's averaging half a block per game. This guy is a really good two-way player. He can score. He can defend with the best of them. The Nets did have a hole at backup shooting guard. I wasn't crazy about Garrett Temple. I thought they were going to let him walk. I'd have been okay with Tyler Johnson being the backup shooting guard, but it's no guarantee that he's going to continue his solid play. God only knows what's going to happen with Spencer Dinwiddie and the trade rumors surrounding him. This is a great move for the Nets. They easily win this trade. And assuming the trade that's being rumored is finalized, the Nets will win it. According to multiple reports, James Harden wants out of Houston and wants to go to the Nets. He wants to form a super team with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. He wants a title. It's the one thing he doesn't have. He has the individual accolades. He's a three-time scoring champion, an eight-time All-Star, former MVP, seven-time All-NBA player. The list goes on and on, but he's never won an NBA title. He got destroyed by the Heat in the NBA Finals about eight years ago. With the Rockets, he never even made the NBA Finals. This guy wants to win. NBA legacies are defined by winning. The greats of the game, Carl Malone, Reggie Miller, Patrick Ewing, Dominique Wilkins... John Stockton, Steve Nash, all those guys would be higher on your list of best NBA players of all time if they had a title. Harden sees the writing on the wall. It's looking bad in Houston right now. You have an owner that doesn't want to spend money. He's lost a lot of money during the pandemic. We've went over that. He owns Landry's, a big restaurant 
entertainment and casino company. Those industries are suffering right now. He may not have the money to pay Harden. Was I against the Rockets trading Harden? Last week, yes. And it's not a good trade for the Rockets if they trade James Harden. They will lose that trade. I don't care how many first-rounders they get in a Harden trade. They'll lose it. This is James Harden we're talking about. One of the five or ten best players in the NBA. To trade a guy like that who's in his prime, who's coming off his third straight year leading the NBA in scoring, is criminal. It's a bad trade for the Rockets. Now, there's a chance it doesn't happen. In fact, Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN said that the Nets and Rockets actually haven't engaged in talks. So what's happening here is the players themselves are communicating. Kevin Durant and James Harden were teammates in OKC. You probably have Harden saying he's upset in Houston and Durant is convincing him that Brooklyn's a great fit for him. You know what? If Durant wants to play with him and Kyrie Irving's on board, which I think he will be, that trade's going to happen. This is a player-driven league. And regardless of how many picks the Nets give up, Whoever the Nets have to give up, Karis LeVert, Jared Allen, Torian Prince, Spencer Dinwiddie, Rodion's Kuruks, the Nets will win it. You have formed one of the best big threes the NBA has ever seen. You have three of the 20 or 25 best players in the NBA in their prime, playing together. Tell me what big three currently can match up with Kevin Durant, James Harden, and Kyrie Irving. You can't. You know why you can't? Because there isn't one. There really aren't any big threes right now. You've got LeBron and AD with the Lakers... Kawhi and Paul George with the Clippers. What, the Celtics? With Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, and Kemba Walker? That's not a great big three. That's not at the LeBron, Wade, and Bosch level. Or the LeBron, Kyrie, and Love level. Don Chich and Porzingis. Lillard and McCollum, Simmons and Embiid. There's no big three. I don't count the Celtics as a big three. Because you know what? That team has done nothing. Those players have done nothing. Put Kevin Durant, James Harden, and Kyrie Irving together, that's a big three. You've got two former NBA champions, two former scoring champions, Two former MVPs, three future Hall of Famers, three All-NBA players, three All-Stars. That's a big three. If the Nets can pull this off, don't even bother playing a season. It's a formality. The Nets are going to win the NBA title. In fact, they're going to win the NBA title the year after. For as long as those three guys are in their primes and playing together, they're going to win the NBA title. You want to give me this, there's only one basketball garbage? You know what? They're going to work it out. They know that. And yeah, there will be some growing pains. There will be moments where... The big three struggles. But it's all going to work itself out. 
LeBron, Wade, and Bosch won two NBA titles together. LeBron, Kyrie, and Love won an NBA title together. In fact, I'll even go a step further. The Oklahoma City Thunder with KD, Westbrook, Harden, and Ibaka made the NBA Finals. Now, they lost to the big three-led Heat. They got destroyed. They lost in five games. But if you replace Russell Westbrook, a guy who's never going to win an NBA title, with Kyrie Irving, a guy who knows how to win, that series may unfold a little differently. Keep in mind, games two, three, and four were close games. Kyrie Irving changes that. I mean, that big three, LeBron, Wade, and Bosch, they're not together anymore. Who's beating a team led by Kevin Durant, James Harden, and Kyrie Irving? The answer is no one. You want to tell me this is reminiscent of the Pearson Garnett trade? No, it's completely different. Pearson Garnett were past their prime. They weren't dominant anymore. They were solid, but they were shells of their former selves. James Harden, again, he's in the prime of his career. Last year was the third straight year that he led the league in scoring. Yes, you mortgage the future for a guy like that. The next window to win is now. Damn the torpedoes. Go full speed ahead. Yes, it's risky. Mortgaging the future is always risky. The Clippers did it for Paul George. It didn't work. The Rockets did it for Russell Westbrook. It didn't work. But you know what? Those guys aren't James Harden. You're not pairing those guys with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. It's completely different. Yes, it's risky. But this is the best opportunity the Nets have had since 2003 to win an NBA title. They need to go all in to support Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. If you're Sean Marks, you need to make this trade happen. And if you can somehow sign Serge Ibaka also, really rebuild that Thunder team that made the NBA Finals, that team is winning over 60 games. That team will be the best team in the NBA. It may even win over 70 games. There has never been a better time to be a Nets fan than now. I don't care what you have to do, Sean Marks. Make this trade happen. Tomorrow, I'm going to recap Vikings, Bears, and go Baseball Hall of Faming the ballot for... The 2021 Hall of Fame class has been announced. This show has gone on long enough. I want to save something for tomorrow. Until then, I am Jacob Volk saying you can lead a horse to water, but you can't stick his head in it.